Welcome back all, Daz from Model Rower Technique. Special guest this week is Dave Abelese from the Onondaga Cutoff Model Railway. We talk all things in part one about this lovely layout, his operations, inspiration behind it. So don't forget to subscribe, like, click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming content. Also, I've got a Patreon page, so a big shout out to my super fans out there. Every little bit counts. So without further ado, let's get started. Up and running is MRT scale print. So if you want Craftsman quality 3D printed prints, email me below. Welcome aboard, Dave Abelese, and thanks for coming on to Model Road Techniques today or this evening in your part of the world. That's correct, Daz. It's good to see you and, and hear you live. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. So if you haven't heard the name Dave Abelese, I in the model train world, I don't know where you've been right now. But then for those people who haven't, um, he's got a YouTube channel. He's got a blog on the Onondaga Cutoff and also a Facebook, Conrail's Onondaga Cutoff by Dave Abelese. I'll put all the links below. There's some great little resources here and some awesome little videos you'll see playing in the background. So Dave, normally I'll, I'll, for at this point with people, I'll go into their history and the model trains, but that's been spoken about a fair bit on the AML Nation. I'll put also the link below some of your interviews there, which are quite amusing. So we won't go into to sort of that side of things. So you and I sort of first met on an NMRX probably early last month on virtual or remote operations. We did sort of a live panel for the Australasian NMRA down here, which was a lot of fun. So reached out, here we are. So first thing we're going to look at is your Onondaga cutoff. So please say, tell me if I'm saying that incorrectly. Um, I, I appreciate the fact you're saying it just right. Uh, and I really appreciate that because not, not everyone, it's a, it's a, actually a term, it's a native American tribal name. Oh, lovely. It was part of the Iroquois nation. Oh, and so there's a County in upstate New York called Onondaga cutoff. Yeah, yeah. And we, that are the, you know, we, it goes to the OC. Everyone will call it the okay. OC for short. Okay, so we'll go to the OC we'll, uh, for now. We'll go both ways. So I'm just going to tell you, I've been lying, uh, just a little bit of a cheat. I've got this underneath my camera, which is, you might see that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Because <laughs> I've been practicing all morning. So it's been, yeah. Um, all right. So OC, we'll call it, affectionately known as. Tell us about your layout. Um, let's just bring, uh, we'll bring up a, a picture of the track plan quickly. So if you obviously this wonderful. So this is uh, the OC as it stands now. This is um, in a model railroad magazine, which is up on your your Facebook page. So tell us about the OC. The OC, the Onondaga Cutoff, is my HO scale layout, uh, patterned after Conrail, the Consolidated Railway Corporation's operations through Central New York State. Which, uh, for those around the world that aren't familiar with the Eastern United States, this is about three hundred miles, two hundred to three hundred miles north and west from New York City on the east coast of the United States. And it was the former New York Central Railroad, which was one of the, the famous trunk lines, trunk, you know, like a, like a packing trunk line, um, which is the, the tag that they use to describe the thoroughfare routes, the routes that carried the, the lion's share of the traffic between New York and Chicago uh, to link up with the western roads that went out to the west coast. And so I'm modeling it in 1994, which is after – a bankruptcy and some changes of ownership, um, but a resurgence in the traffic. And it's, it's finally remembered by me as a 17, 18 year old kid. Um, my, we, my mom had a, a variety of family lived up in that general area. So I was fortunate to be able to spend some time along that railroad as a young man, as an impressionable young person. And my first car was a, a used minivan that had been my father's. And so that, that became, uh, that became the vehicle by which to go up and around and watch trains. And yeah. the, the, the memories of a young teenage guy with his friends watching the trains were, have become permanent and were the inspiration to model this particular piece of railroad. So it's a double deck railroad. We do regular operating sessions and it sort of became clear in the, during the pandemic that, that we could do some of this stuff online using some of the remote stuff that we had started to build into. And we'll get into that, you know, as, as the talk goes yeah, on, definitely. but uh, in, a, in a nutshell, that's, that's the Onondaga Cutoff, the yeah. OC. So you describe your layout as a sort of proto-freelance. So I'll, various people I've been talking to, I've spoken to Dave Ramos, who he says he's proto-freelance, but he's probably more the prototype in. So if you've got a continuum of 
full prototype one end, free full freelance the other. Where do you think the OC sits in in that continuum? It's a good discussion. I I, I think that. And it's ironic. I was I just operated on Dave Ramos layout. He's from Clifton, New Jersey, and I was just there on Friday night. We had a wonderful operating session. Yeah. This is a really neat model railroad oh, is, uh, based on the harbor operations around around New York City, and yeah. it's in 1947, if I'm not mistaken. So it's right in the transition era. Lots of neat first generation diesels and yeah. different operations. Really, really a neat concept. And where he see, and this is it, sort of comes down to the definition of what we consider prototype versus the freelance. He certainly models a prototypical route on a railroad that existed. I model a prototypical route on a railroad that could have existed. So <laughs> if you look at so really they're, they're both proto-freelance if you look at you know the actual art of model railroading. Yeah. But when you look at they're both prototype operations. We both operate our railroads in accordance with what the prototype railroad would have used with the symbols and the times, the schedules. Uh, one of the really neat aspects of his layout is that he actually has the loading and unloading times, the, the car spot times. So all of his switching, his, his car spotting, can only be done. You can only make a pickup once a car has been there for long enough. So he really captures that urban industrial feel of, of a high density operation because you you have to go in and you have to respot cars, which is which is fascinating. So, but what we do on the Onondaga cutoff, since the route itself was never prototypically in existence. I mean, th this route here runs through a valley that actually does exist, but they never built the railroad there, uh, at least not part of the New York Central. And so I consider my freelancing a little more loose than his from a location, from a geographic standpoint. But I think operationally, we, we both try and accomplish the same thing. And I think that's one of the great limitations of model railroading is trying to figure out how to capture the flavor of the prototype sure. and distill that down with selective compression into what we can fit in the basement. Yeah. And the New, York, the New York Central around Syracuse is such a grand operation. Conrail, even in the 90s, that it was such a huge operation that to fit that in my little basement here in suburban New Jersey, um, I think yeah. I'd be able to model one interlocking. <laughs> and that's I wanted, I wanted to capture the intensity of the mainline operation. And so therefore, I elected sort of to come around and, and build a fictional bypass to a prototype city sure. that would be, would be built in accordance with the modern the modern standards of those times. And it, it really does, I think it does a good job of capturing some of that trackside intensity, which of course is what you guys see on the live videos, yeah, you know, yeah. when we do those, yeah, yeah. that's become a lot of fun. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. You, you touched on virtual and remote operations. We could spend a whole two hours just talking about that, I think. So um, I think we spent well over an hour on the, on the virtual chat um, last month and didn't really dive all that deeply in into the ins and outs because obviously depending on what system you're using you're using cats jmri i'm using train controller two very very separate pieces of software so to speak but sure with trying to achieve the same thing is someone remote from the from the layout being able to... and daz i think i think it's beautiful because i think what you're doing and what i'm doing it's we, we talked about it extensively sure. on the round table which was a ball that was a lot of fun to go through and I think the, the message to everyone is that the tools are out there and we can there are there are people you can reach out to. I mean, certainly through the OC Facebook page or, or, or through your channel here, Daz, as well. You know, there are resources for people to reach out if they're interested in, in seeing how it's done or seeing how we did it. And you can do it. There's different ways to skin the cat, as they used to say. Um, but I think the idea is that you know, where there's a will, there is a way yeah, now. And that's definitely. that's sort of the, one of the greatest effects of the pandemic i think that's a lot of fun is that you know a lot of hardship for a lot of people around the world yeah. and, and our hearts go out to everybody that was affected negatively yeah. but human beings are resilient and i think we found a way we model railroaders found a way forward i think even even in the darkness of the pandemic yeah. which is very exciting definitely so as i said we could probably talk about that some more at a later time if you if you wanted to catch up how you've done it there's dave have a share and a beer there it's fantastic <laughs> amen buddy. i got up barley now and again <laughs> shameless plug shameless plug um all right so back to the operation side of things so tell us the the types of trains you run how many in an operating session you would run so we the everything's based very much on the prototype for the operating session so we, you know we built the infrastructure to be able to handle the typical density of a day on, on Conrail Chicago line. Um, 
anywhere from 40 to 60 trains, depending on the certain day and the wow. time of year, yeah. uh, extra session. So heavy, heavy duty, double track main line, uh, all controlled with the signals on the, on the main line. Anyway, the yard, of course, and the switching is all done by hand and that's all dark territory. So part of the interplay that's fun, I think for, for, for people on the OC is that, is that back and forth between the different, different permissions and the different rules that govern different tracks. Yeah. Uh, but what we do is we take a, a, a good look at the schedule that Conrail ran in the 94, 95, 96, which included, you know, just an onslaught of all sorts of different trains. It's one of the reasons it was so exciting to watch trains up there uh, in in the mid-90s, because it was really Conrail's artery between the East Coast and the West Coast. Sure. And whereas the Pennsylvania Railroad to the South, the PRR, Horseshoe Curve and Pittsburgh and, you know, a lot of a lot of the popular spots to watch trains down there world famous horseshoe curve of course yeah, busiest yeah. mountain railroad in the world for, for a time uh that was a lot of online industry a lot of coal mining down there a lot of heavy steel industry whereas to the north and in, in across central new york as time went on there was less manufacturing and very little mining up there so that that became conrail's high speed artery for east west traffic the time sensitive stuff and so very early on was was it got a clearance improvement so they could run the double stack trains and the vehicular trains, the auto rack trains back and forth. Yeah, sure. And so one of the things that sets this railroad apart from other Conrail railroads in that same era is that Conrail, most of the routes were old enough that they were built with only a 17-foot height clearance. New York Central was no exception, but because they modernized that in 87, they raised it up to 23 feet everywhere. This was one of the first places on Conrail where you saw the stack trains. Nice. It was one of the first places on Conrail where you saw vehicular trains and not one once a day or twice a day, but, you know, 10 each way a day. Wow. And yeah. then another five vehicular trains and another five just regular rubber tire truck trailer trains that, you know, the, the, the intermodals yeah. plus the manifest train. So, yeah. and then the occasional grain train or coal train to the power plants or to the, to the port of Albany in New York on the Hudson river, which is tide water. Yeah. And just that, that kind of density and, and watching a dispatcher and, and a, and a operating crew, manage that experience where you've got different important trains that have to have to vie around the way freights and the locals that have to work the yard while fouling the main line and how does he route trains around that and, and you really capture a lot of that density and the urgency uh that we felt trackside as the economy was growing and sure. everything was looking really good in the 90s yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was uh it's a fun it's a fun to look back on and it's fun to go through it with the guys here on a monthly basis yeah nice nice so i give the punters, some sort of idea, the size, obviously we've got your layout picture up again, the, the size of the room sure. that the OC sits in, to sort of, so we can give some sort of scale to to the size of uh, of your layout. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's you know, to, to, to say it in, in U.S. feet, it's, it's, the walking space is roughly about 20, 22 feet by about 30, 32 feet. Right. Uh, the layout space is slightly larger than that, you can see that on the track plan. Yeah. But, you know, the walls, it's an around the walls layout with that big peninsula. And so, you know, you kind of have to navigate that as you go through the operating session. But it's a full height. One of the important things, I think, for an operation operating layout is the full height backdrop. Yeah. And you can just see that you can just see the top of it behind me here from where the camera is. But the idea is that the train goes from someplace to somewhere else. And especially when you've got the long trains on these trunk lines, we generally our trains run from the mainline freights that was are between 25 and 55 cars. Wow. Um, depending on what we're running. Yeah, yeah. So they really wrap around. Yeah. And when one of these trains is working on a dog a yard, the head end is, you know, 35 feet around the whole peninsula from the, from the trailing end. So you add some sound locomotives and the only link between the conductor brakeman on the back end of the train and the engineer up in the cab is the radio and oh. they have to work together via radio to make that happen. And that's part of the adventure is definitely the radio discussion, the radio yeah, yeah. protocol on the other I've definitely heard some of that on your, your live videos, and as I said, I'll link some of those below because they're good fun watching and drinking a beer as you did before. So um, let's touch on the paperwork side of things. Now, I'll, I'll find a link, and I'm pretty sure it's on your website somewhere. You've got like your, your rule book timetable sort of document that uh, outlines all the jobs on the railway. Can you sort of talk to us a little bit about, about that side of things? Sure, and I it's... Now, a lot of people, I think, in, in the model railroading, because it's supposed to be fun, right? So a lot of people don't want to get heavy into the paperwork. And our friend Lionel is uh, always <laughs> hilarious. I don't do the paperwork. That's not what I'm here for. Uh, but 
one of the important things that I, one of the reasons I find railroading so central to my life and why philosophically I feel like I've got so much invested in it is that it really does depend on a team of people to do it every single time. Sure. And the paperwork, the paperwork is the universal link between people. So rather than relying on just speech or a handshake or understanding, paperwork in black and white with, with, with diagrams and data, numbers that you can count, number of cars, and the name of every track, this is the universal language of railroading. Sure. So paperwork links the different parts of the operation together and gives us all all the operating people, it gives us something that we can hold on to, literally, right? We can actually touch it. Um, that, that is sort of the keys of the kingdom. And so what I've tried to do with my paperwork is copy what Conrail created with their paperwork, which allowed this very diverse group of people. I mean, you had men and women. In the 90s, there was, there's, you know, blacks, there's Asians, there's Islanders, there's European immigrants, there's people that you know, that, that came up from poverty level and took a job on the railroad because it was the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. There's college people, there's college dropouts. There's, you know, you, you really, you really got an, a, a slice of the American population that handled moving all this freight. Mm -hmm. And it really is a model for some of what we're trying to get to, I think in the world at large. But so the paperwork, the paperwork encourages that teamwork and it gives you a, a standard by which everyone can draw to make decisions while they're operating the train. So stuff like, you know, route maps and, and diagrams of the interlocking so you can see how the switches are laid out. Uh, you know, written permission for who's in charge of what track. So who do you talk to to get permission to use a track? Which are signal controlled, which are written by a track authority, like a track warrant. Mm. And the important thing to remember is that, yeah, we've, we've developed this paperwork over years with, with myself and a bunch of other professional railroaders it helped me get to the point now where, where I think it's pretty much universal and everyone can understand it. That doesn't need it doesn't need to go there for the for the first draft. Yeah. And you know, naming every track and having a line diagram that shows your entire railroad and what every track is named. It's nice, you know, it's not that track over there or you know, put five cars in that one. No, it's <laughs> I need you to push five cars east into the east lead yeah. or uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you yeah, know, sure. and I think that's sort of the idea that, that again, there's a common language and camaraderie and the teamwork that it takes to run these operations is based on that common language. So the paperwork is almost a form of scenery yeah. that allows the keys to the kingdom to be to be universally accessed. Yeah. Now, I didn't show you my my batting list. Some of the questions I wanted to to bring up with you, but you've just gone straight on to the beginning of operations. That was one of my first questions. You just don't wake up in the morning and go, hey. The, the OC is now fully formed operating layout with, you know, 12 or so gentlemen or ladies coming to run it. Obviously, it's built over time. So we've started to talk about advice to your advice um, to start people in operations. So what you're saying is name everything. So I think that that was one of the, the first sections in um, it's a Karl Marx book plea, uh, by Tony Costa, I reckon it is, on starting That's operations. That talks about correct. you need to yep. name everything, not just that that track that sits over in the corner there. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. name the industry, track number, and, and so forth. So um, what other advice can you give? So after sort of naming things, uh, what sort of advice would you give to a novice like myself um, to get into to operations? Because I think it's... It's exciting. It's not just a matter of running trains around. It's not toy-like anymore. We're trying to run a mini transportation system, as I've seen the phrase being used before, um, as it would be in the real world. Correct. And I think that there's a couple different points. I mean, to start off really generally, to have a vision for what you're trying to accomplish. You know, what what part of what what operation are you looking to to emulate or or encapsulate and it's not that you have to model conrail in 94 or new york central in 1947 to reference dave olson's layout or even to be totally freelance you look at bill darnaby's mommy route out in indiana um or illinois i should say in the central united states like that there's a totally freelance railroad that runs like the prototype and is part of the prototype operating world because it still captures that same energy so is it is it a Granger road? Is, you know, does it, does it exist to switch grain mills? Does it exist to move automotive traffic or, you know, intermodals like the OC does? 
I think having a vision for what you're trying to capture. You know, if you look at the Transcontinental Railroad in Australia, mm. long, straight runs, you know, with these long passing sidings and scheduled meets so that you can try and minimize the time waiting out there. You know, that's that's a certain kind of operation. Yeah. But then, that you know, the, 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 you know, the area around, if you go like, if you look at like South Australia, like around the Adelaide Hills, for mm. example, mm. you know, the grainers that come out of the port of Adelaide and head uphill back to reload up, up in, up in the, you know, South Australia, and then come back down up yeah. between Melbourne and, and Adelaide. Yeah. There's, there's a totally different personality to that railroad. Or you look at, you know, the route up to Darwin with the land bridge trucks and the container trains mm. periodically. Mm. So different, there's different, a different atmosphere you're looking for. So I think having, having a goal to copy the energy of one of those operations is important. Sure. Some other people just want to switch the yard and their, their operation is you bring a, a, a cut of cars in, we switch the yard for the day, cut yeah. of cars to go back out, and that's that's the whole operating session. And it's a legitimate operation. So what you're looking for, I think, is important. So once you've got things named and you know what you want to capture, I think then, then it's time to start to look at which industries receive the switching and what kind of cars are going to need to get there. Yeah. So you'll need a, a local yard. Mine's called Onondaga Yard, which you're seeing here in the live videos. And Onondaga, every car in and out of Onondaga actually has a home on the layout. Yeah. It's either, either headed to an industry or it's headed to interchange with another railroad, Susquehanna or with, um, you know, with, with the, with the M&E, the Morris, the Manoa and Euclid yeah, uh, nice. owned by the Morris tenant. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's, that gives every car a purpose. So it's not just in the yard cause it looks nice. Um, if it, if it looks nice, that's great, but it's actually there for a, for a transportation reason. And I think that's part of the reason it's exciting is that, there's a compelling nature to that. And the, the, the mix of cars looks neat, but it changes all the time because of the operation more than it does because you want to make sure how it looks a certain way. So really, really neat. And it's, I, I think that, yeah, yeah again, it's, it's, there's a lot of ways to go, but to get started, you know, to decide the energy you want to capture and then to almost take all the cars off your layout and decide how many cars for each industry yeah. and put those back on Start with those, and then you can start to fill in the gaps as you keep going. Yeah, yeah, good advice. But, um, good advice. You know, the, proto the prototype, I think, you know, they don't have extra cars around. Those those get stored someplace because sure. they, they need that space for the revenue cars. Yeah, yeah. So to emulate the prototype like that is, I, th I think, an important part of of um, you know of getting of getting started. A lot of people have too many cars on the layout. Yeah, yeah. And it takes away some of the fun because they look great, you know, but it but it doesn't actually get you started with 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 the running of the train yeah, which is which sure, is an important sure. piece so that's sort of the next so you built your layout what are in your opinion where well, obviously this is how long is a piece of string scenario but what are the must-have aspects for your layout obviously we're now talking depending on what type of trains we're going to run but say what okay we'll talk about the the oc what are the, the the key aspects of the oc to run what how you want to run your layout you need to have a team of good people that are willing to jump in with both feet and almost almost do a little role-playing exercise yeah and there's some people that are comfortable with that and there's some people who aren't and they, they you know you quickly see the difference when you when you when you go to an operating session um i think Having, having paperwork that's accessible to everyone. Uh, it's an inclusive atmosphere. A little bit of ribbing or uh, the old ball busting is certainly <laughs> fine. That's, that's part of railroading, right? But, but on the other hand, it's, it's not about making fun of someone or making someone feel silly. It's the, the yeah. goal here is to come together yeah. to move the trains. So having a strong emphasis on let's go, you know, let, let's, let's, uh, let's, you know, you have a question, ask, but, you know, make a decision and move on. This is an operation. Yeah. Um, that's compelling. I think having, you know, breaking some bread ahead of time, you know, order some pizza or some sandwiches ahead of time that you can have with, with a soda or barley or whatever you'd like to drink ahead of the session. And you, you talk about what's going on in the world and, and a little bit of a safety briefing. You talk about where the fire extinguisher is, where the, where the emergency exit is, uh, what to do in the event of a fire, a little bit of a safety ask. And it, again, it's important for safety, but it also helps build that camaraderie, which is so important, that teamwork. Yeah. You know, we're all here for the same reason. But having once you get to operating, that's when the preparation becomes key. So having having someone you can trust to proofread your paperwork, uh, having someone you can trust to come on over and help you do a setup night, clean track, 
having every piece of track have a, have a set of feeders to it so you don't have any stalls, making sure the locomotive wheels are clean and the coupler heights are correct so that you don't have all those mechanical failures. A, a, lot, of, a lot of the operating session is a lot less fun when it, the layout doesn't run well. And run, run, you know, it's really important to have the running sure. clean to make sure that that stuff works out. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So... Also in Tony Custer's book where he sort of said this is very early on in the operating, so you say you've built a portion of the layout or you've built the layout, and then I think it's important from that point just to start playing with trains. So that might be as simple as running a train from point A to point B, obviously all name, name tracks, and then say you've got a, a, a rake of three box cars in like a local freight or something similar, and then you're just switching those individual like like I think he calls it like for like cars. Is that something that you did on the OC or um, very early on to sort of keep the momentum and keep the the fire in the belly going? So more than anything, I think so. Abs- absolutely, and that does that's great advice for everyone jumping in because to be honest, when we started out, we we even though we all worked for the railroad, like you know the, all the wisdom keepers, as I say, as I, I've said on the AML a bunch of times, you know the, the people that I look up to. My peers, but also also elders, we didn't realize the, the, the rich nature of model railroading in New Jersey when, when Jack and I put together the OC. Yep. And when we built this railroad, it was me and, and a friend that was good with his hands for the carpentry and Jack, who was doing the, the transportation side of things and coming up with some operating plans. So early on, I would take a, a hole punch with different colored paper and the yard, I would randomly go through the yard and all the Western road names got certain color and all the eastern road names got a certain color and the local delivery got a certain color and i'd mix them up by hand and the yard master was told to classify by color and then certain trains came in to pick up those outbounds and it was just three or four of us that would run the railroad yeah the uh the first operating session was in 2011 and it was six of us um there's there's a there's a picture i can send you that is it's actually on the blog if you look it's at the 10th anniversary and stuff I you'll did see, see it that. yeah but yeah. it's me and Jack and a handful of other people that there's no scenery, there's no backdrop. It's, it's, we were just, we were, we were playing with trains and pushing the limits of what we could do, you know, shoving back in the yard. But it, it, it was much more an exercise in, in seeing how things ran. Yeah. And I learned quickly that, you know, I wanted to put my interlockings on something more firm than, than uh, the, the, the spongy foam roadbed. Yeah. So I, I moved over to put those on cork so it was stiffer. Yeah. Uh, we learned that we needed another interlocking at CP294 uh, that would allow trains to cross over coming out of staging. And, and then having a staging yard, that's that's sort of another important yeah, part of operating. Yeah. Is having some some sort of offstage area where you where you have cars – either track or cars that come onto your layout or space to go off your layout that allows the world beyond the layout to be represented. Uh, that's, that's, that's a really key part of operations yeah, going yeah, forward. Definitely. definitely. Now that's good advice. That's something I've now built two staging facility or three different levels on mine just for that very thing, you know, somewhere because we can't model everything on a model railway. So we need to have the rest of the world, no. the rest of the world, as I call it, or world trains um, within train controller, because it lights a name for everything. So oh, 100%. <laughs> I think this is where yeah. model railroading from my point of view is so much fun because we're, we're at a real crossroads in some regards. Um, and I won't coin young Lionel's phrase about the goo, but I think this, this hobby's got it all because it's got the tactile model building. You've brought computerization into your layout like I have. I think all these key factors are perfect for the youth coming into the hobby. Um, you got like, I've spoken to young Drew before um, yes. on, the, on my uh, my channel probably a few months ago. Um, and I've been racking my brain. I've got a, a 10 year old lad that loves puzzles. How do I get him involved? I had him out in the yard yesterday, switching the yard, just saying, this is just a big virtual puzzle, mate, and bang. You could just see that the light came on in his head, and away he went, just shunted, or we call it shunting, you switching, switching the yard. Yep. So I think it's really important. Just It's not just a matter of running trains around anymore, but purposefully moving them around and getting young people involved. You know, you and I are, well, I'm 46. Um, you're obviously probably early 40s, late 30s. Um, yeah, I'm 44. Yeah, so it's, it's about the same. Yeah. 
And my, my kids too, you know, they, they both, my, my boys both have the train bug and yeah. Susie loves to spend time with dad. So yeah. that, that helps too. Yeah. Um, but, but I think, you know, looking for ways to get, to get the youth involved. And this is where, you know, the fellows behind JMRI and the fellows behind Y throttle, you know, and the, and the internet based approach to things. Yeah. And the fact that now that you can do a Facebook live video or you could do a FaceTime chat while you're switching or shunting these these are these are these are openings or they're avenues for people to come together Correct. and bring in that next generation i think this hobby's got it's all I, I you've got history you've got carpentry you've got electrical you've got yeah. the problem solving you've got labor relations you've got management you know you've got yeah. you've got these different layers yeah you've got the personality aspect you've got the transportation side of things of course but also the heavy equipment the fine scale modeling, the weathering, yeah. like all it really does. It's, it's, it's got everything that a lot of other hobbies have plus this operations. Yeah. And to me, the operations is that's, that's, that's really what, what makes the hobby grand yeah. is that you can actually impersonate what the actual railroaders do, yeah. not just their equipment, not just their history, but what they, that the actual operation, the reason those trains existed. Yeah, definitely. And what a, what a fun thing to tap into. I mean, you know, how often do you have that chance in yeah, life yeah. to actually model something that's this important? Yeah. Ah, it's it's just it's a great hobby. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. And to, and to speak about it with you, mate, this is a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. And it brings us together as well. Who would have thought a year or two years ago, my, my YouTube's going, I've just been doing probably interviews the last year that I'd be talking to someone in your neck of the woods. I've spoken to you're the second person <laughs> from Model Railroader of I've spoken to Pele Solberg. I interviewed him a little while back. So two legends of the model railroading world, yourself and him, obviously. So um, <laughs> thank you. Who would have thought? Just the community it, it comes wild. together. Um, it's unbelievable. It's, it's wild. And there's so, so much to look forward to with it too. It really, I think, the best is yet to come with this in every aspect of that term. Yeah. Um, you know, every, everything we're doing is getting better as we go forward here. Definitely. Definitely. Now, Dave, I, these topics we could talk all day about easily and probably we'll dive maybe at a later stage, if you're willing, if we, once our stars align to jump back into something like remote ops or something like that. I don't know yet. Sure. So, yeah, I'd be honoured. Yeah. I'd love to. probably go for an hour in itself. But I think it's also important, and I like to try to do this. We've touched on this briefly. A big shout out to our awesome wives and our, par our partners, if it's a partner significant others one my nancy was my wife Kristen, your wife who allow us the time to sit away from the family like they are today take money out of our personal budgets to pursue Amen. our hobby which is significant in this hobby and also time away from the family as we've i just like to sort of touch on that briefly i think it's a nice fitting way and probably including your you know she obviously Kristen's read your your book <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's time away from her and also your, your lovely kids. And I think that needs to be acknowledged. Um, and I think it's... I think it's a um, central point, Daz. And I appreciate you bringing that up because... And this is something when you when you read the uh, acknowledgements in the book, I, I, I really tried to, to make that point. Yeah. Uh, because just like, you know, we were talking about foundations of the signal system before and that block detection, which is so universal across so many different kinds of railroading worldwide. Well... I think it's really important to remember that the family, the spouse, the partner, you know, that's the foundation of civilization worldwide. Yeah. There's not a civilization in this world that doesn't look up to family, that doesn't, that doesn't value family. Yeah. And I feel so grateful and so fortunate to have found such a wonderful woman that shares that vision and that is so gracious so that even after a crazy long holiday weekend, July 4th, you know, the Independence Day holiday here in America, yeah. um, you know, we're all maxed out. I, I still have to put the tap system away. It's <laughs> it's getting late at night. I got to go out and put the garbage out. Yeah. But Chris says, oh, go ahead, you know, go ahead. I, 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 I you know, enjoy it. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of cleaning up tonight. And it was so the foundation of humanity, which is the family in so many ways and mm. and and the love that we share, not just for a spouse or a partner, but also for. A, a mate, you know, a best buddy, a, a great friend for other people we're meeting in the hobby. I mean, I feel like I know you guys more than I would have ever thought through, just through the internet. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, 
Uh, you know, it'll be a handshake when we meet, but it's also going to be a hug, buddy. Oh, yeah. it's just, there's just no way about I it. Like a man, I like a good man hug. <laughs> yes, amen. And it's, but I mean, what a, what a what a wonderful time we live in, where these kind of connections are mm. not just possible, but are, but are becoming more common. And you know, for, for to have women and and family that support it and that, that like to be yeah. part of it, um, it's 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 a breath of fresh air. It, it's the foundation upon which all of my creative ability is is founded. Because without Kristen and the kids, I don't think I have a stable foundation on which to write. Yeah. So I really feel very, very grateful. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Big thank you if you can thank your lovely family for allowing this uh, over an hour now um, for chatting with me on Moderaro Techniques today. It's been a pleasure. I'm, my mind's boggling with some of the stuff we've spoken about, and I'm sure I'll reach out again. But love to be involved in the running the OC at some stage from my neck of the woods. As I said, I won't try to do a Marty Jenkins. Um. <laughs> count on, Daz, count on it. You, I mean, there's, there's a few people that, that, that are interested in doing some remote, so we're going to do a, yeah. a remote training session at some point this summer. We'll, we'll pick a night, yeah, that'd be good. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll find a way to just, to just you know, kick the rust yeah. off a little bit so that people can get a flavor for it. Yeah. And so count on it. We'll, uh, we'll, 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 be, we'll be moving forward together. Yeah, that'd be great. And it's been such a, an enjoyable chat, and God bless to you and your family. Best wishes, my friend. Right. Take care, Thank mate. Thank you very much. Yep, bye-bye. Make sure you subscribe, click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon, like us on Facebook and Instagram at Model Railroad Techniques.